In this video, we're going to talk about all things bacteria. Now, before we can get into bacteria, we need to remind ourselves about how we group and classify uh, living organisms. In our Whitaker's Five Kingdom system, all the bacteria are included in the kingdom Monarin. And the thing that distinguished the Monarins is that they were prokaryotic. They were cells that lacked a nucleus. And all the other kingdoms, protist, fungus, plants, and animals, were eukaryotic. Now, with modern technology advances, we've discovered a lot more about the monarins, the prokaryotic cells. And in doing so, a, a new system of classification has incorporated a level higher than kingdoms called domains. The reason for this change is that when looking at the monarins, or the bacteria, we found that there's a very distinct uh, separation between two different groups of monarins. So much difference that they probably belonged in their own category. So, what used to be monarins is now split among to the two domains, bacteria and archaea, or archaea bacteria. The remainder of our kingdoms, the protists, the fungus, the plants, and the animals, are in the domain eukarya, those cells with uh, a nucleus. Now let's look at this split between the archaea bacteria and the bacteria. All cells that are prokaryotic belong to one of these two domains. Now, the variation or the difference between these two domains includes things, <clears throat> some of the differences between the archaea bacteria and bacteria include uh, some very significant DNA and RNA structural differences, or uh, not so much structural differences, but in terms of how they're uh, designed and used. Um, some differences in a very important enzyme called RNA polymerase, where the archaea bacteria's RNA polymerase is more similar to the uh, RNA polymerase in the eukarya uh, than it is to the, uh, and similar to the uh, eubacteria, the bacteria. And uh, how they respond to different antibiotics is different, and there are some structural differences. So, when we look at these two groups, uh, we're going to talk first about the archaea bacteria and then kind of leave them alone for the rest of this discussion and spend most of our time with the with what most known prokaryotes are, uh, the true bacteria. Now, the archaea bacteria include some very interesting uh, types of bacteria. The halophiles, the thermophiles, and the methanogens. Collectively, these are sometimes referred to as the extremophiles. These are bacteria that live in very extreme conditions, uh, conditions that may be very similar to early Earth conditions. The halophiles, hallow means salt. These are salt lovers. We find the halophiles in places uh, with extreme salt conditions, like a salt lake. The thermophiles are heat lovers. We find these thermophiles living in places like thermal vents and hot springs where the water coming out of the earth is uh, near 100 degrees um, and boiling. And uh, these uh, bacteria seem to be able to thrive in those conditions, so their enzymes are, are specialized for those extreme temperature conditions. And then, this is spelled wrong, the methanogens uh, are bacteria that are anaerobic, meaning they're without oxygen. They live in very oxygen poor, swamp, mud like conditions, and they produce methane gas as a byproduct of their metabolism. Now, with these differences pointed out, we are going to spend most of our time talking about bacteria. Most known prokaryotes are bacteria. So let's just move on, assuming that we're talking about this side of things, and leave the archaea bacteria behind for a while. So, what are bacteria? First, let's think about this. The bacteria are the most abundant and most diverse ecologically on our planet, meaning there are bacteria in greater numbers and in greater locations on the Earth than any other type of organism. The question is why? Why is it that we find bacteria spread all across the planet? The answer is they've been here the longest. We believe that the earliest organisms on Earth were probably very similar to modern day bacteria in terms of their structure and their metabolism. In general, characteristics for bacteria is that they are prokaryotic, meaning they lack a nucleus. They have a singular piece of DNA that is circular, rather than the multiple pieces and linear DNA that we have in eukaryotic cells. Some of them will have extra pieces of DNA, smaller pieces called plasmids, that contain non-essential genes. Many of them have cell walls composed of a carbohydrate called peptidoglycan, and they reproduce by a process called binary fission which we're going to discuss soon. Um, and then again, as a kingdom, they show a great diversity of modes of metabolism and habitat. 
So if we look at this simple diagram of a bacteria, it has a cell wall, it has a plasma membrane, the cytoplasm. It does have these organelles, ribosomes, which you know are important for protein production. Here's its singular piece of circular DNA that we see here. It's all folded up. It is one circular ring. And here's an extra small plasmid, a smaller piece of DNA, which holding non-essential genes. We can also see the flagella, which help in the motility of the bacteria. Let's quickly run through some more of the structure of the bacteria. Again, they're prokaryotic, lacking a nucleus, lacking large membrane-bound organelles. They do have a cell wall made of a carbohydrate called peptidoglycan. That's significant because we know that all cell walls are made of carbohydrates. In plant cells, they're made of cellulose, and in fungus cells, they're made of chitin, uh, just a different type of carbohydrate here. Um, when we look at bacteria, there's one way to kind of easily differentiate between different broad groups of bacteria, and that's whether they uh, are gram stain positive or gram stain negative. And the gram stain is a chemical stain that you can apply to uh, a sample of bacteria, and the ones that are gram stain positive will show up dark purple, as we see here and here, and the ones that are gram stain negative will show up uh, in this pink color. And this helps us differentiate between known uh, types of bacteria. And the reason why they stain differently has to do with the structural difference in their uh, cell membrane and cell wall. The bacteria that are gram negative have a cell membrane, a thin cell wall, and then another membrane on the outside, whereas the gram stain positive bacteria have a cell membrane and a, and a thicker cell wall that re reacts with this chemical stain differently. Another way we can differentiate between bacteria is their basic shape. And there are three basic bacterial shapes, spirilli, bacilli, and cocci, spiral, rod-shaped, and spherical. Oftentimes, these names, spirilli, bacilli, and cocci, are built into the scientific name for that bacteria. You'll definitely need to be able to match these names, uh, these terms, with these, these shapes and by sight and by by uh, words here. And we talked uh, briefly a minute ago that uh, many bacteria are modal. They have a long whip-like tail called a flagella. Some do. Sometimes they have a simple one singular flagella, sometimes multiple. They can have them on both ends to go one direction or the other without turning around. And sometimes they have uh, many coming off on all different sides. The point here is that the bacteria can respond and move away or towards a stimuli. Now we said that bacteria are very diverse in habitat, but also very diverse in their metabolism. If we look across the broad categories of metabolisms as they exist in the living world, there are basically four types of metabolic uh, of ways to go about uh, getting your energy. And two broad groups: you can be autotrophic, organisms that are autotrophic make their own food, or it can be heterotrophic, where you have to find food. Within each of these two broad categories, we have more specific uh, classifications. Photoautotrophs are autotrophs that use light to make their own food. Light's the energy source. Carbon dioxide from the air is their carbon source. They're going to make these organic nutrients with. And animals that fall into this category, sorry, not animals, organisms that fall into this category include photosynthetic bacteria, algae, which are protists, and of course plants. We also have chemoautotrophs. These are typically, uh, well, these are only found in, amongst the bacteria. We have bacteria here also, where their energy source is uh, from chemical, inorganic chemical reactions. They still use carbon dioxide as their carbon source, and they use the energy from these reactions to drive the production of organic molecules using carbon from carbon dioxide. Among the heterotrophs, we have photoheterotrophs that use light as their energy source. Organic compounds, however, as their uh, carbon source, they have to ingest some carbon compounds. And here again, we find that certain bacteria can do this. And then there are the chemoheterotrophs, which we generally think as heterotrophs, where they have to gain uh, energy through organic compounds. They have to eat. Their carbon source comes from the food they eat or ingest or absorb. And here again, we see bacteria. We also, also see many protists, fungus. Fungus have to feed, and of course, animals. Now, the interesting point about this diagram is to see that we see bacteria here, 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 and here. So there's a metabolic diversity across the bacteria. There's also diversity in oxygen needs among the bacteria. There are kind of three different ways you can go with oxygen. You can be an obligate aerobe. Aerobe, aerobic means with oxygen. Anaerobic, ana means without oxygen, or an means without. Uh, and obligate. If you're obligated to do something, that means you're kind of required to, you have to. So an organism that is an obligate aerobe, oops, 
nor organism that's obligate aerobe must have oxygen. Without it, it doesn't survive. Now, facultative anaerobes will use oxygen when it's present. They'll use oxygen when it's present. However, they can switch over to an anaerobic process when oxygen is not available. In other words, they have the faculties or the abilities to use oxygen. Uh, they have the faculties and abilities to be anaerobic when they have to be. They kind of have the best of both worlds. And then they're the obligate anaerobes. They're obligated to not have oxygen. In fact, to them, oxygen is poisonous. Again, we're seeing a diversity among the bacteria. You don't see this with the other kingdoms. Uh, plants and animals and fungus, all uh, they must have oxygen. Well, there are a few fungus that don't, but we don't see this diversity among many other groups. And again, the reason for all this diversity is that bacteria have been on the planet long enough to uh, diversify and adapt to all different types of conditions. In our second part of the video, we're going to talk about bacterial reproduction and exchanges of genetic material. How bacteria make more bacteria and how they can change in time genetically. We're going to keep that for the second part of the video. For the last part of this first video, I want to talk about bacteria's role in disease and also the beneficial and positive sides of bacteria. So, can bacteria cause disease? Well, of course they can, but there are tons of examples. Tuberculosis, strep throat, diphtheria, anthrax, syphilis, gonorrhea, Lyme's disease, botulism, salmonella poisoning, staph infections. This is just a few of the different types of illnesses caused by these pathogens, these bacteria. You can see uh, these are the scientific names over here. Uh, these are the common names. There's a lot of different types of bacteria infection. So what can we do to combat bacteria? Well, we've learned that better food preparation and storage over uh, history and use of refrigeration has greatly reduced the amount of bacterial infections we will get. Cleaning water, water treatment plants have helped uh, remove bacteria from our water supply. Better hygiene, washing hands and uh, cleaning materials, think about surgical tools and how we uh, sterilize them. Before that, we knew that about those things, um, bacterial infections were much more common. So before we knew that bacteria existed, meaning before we had the technology, um, we didn't even know to do these things. Now we know and we can combat bacteria this way. Uh, in terms of beyond that, our body has natural barriers to infection. Our skin is a good barrier. Our mucous membranes are in our nasal passages and throat help track bacteria. The acids in our stomach help uh, block the action of the bacteria. So uh, our body automatically tries to fight off certain types of bacteria. And if the bacteria get past those initial barriers to infection, our immune system kicks in and tries to fight off the infection. And of course, we do have medicines or antibiotics. Antibiotic means antibacterial. Antibiotics will do us no good against a viral infection. And it's interesting, we'll learn later in the year how, or during, during class, how antibiotics were discovered um, by accident. We'll talk about that in class shortly. And with the few minutes we have left for this video, I want to talk about the beneficial side of bacteria. While they can cause disease and we think about getting rid of bacteria, there's a lot of ways in which bacteria are, are beneficial and vital, in fact, to the way our planet works. For example, we have resident bacteria in and around us. We have bacteria that live in our gut, in our mouth, and on our skin. And while we think that might be a bad thing, it turns out that uh, the bacteria that live in our intestines help release certain vitamins from food that we couldn't get otherwise. The bacteria that live in our mouth help fight off fungal infections in our mouth. Who wants that? And the bacteria that live in our skin, or on our skin, um, while they st thrive there, um, actually keep other bacteria from taking up residency there. So we have these beneficial relationships li in our living with uh, our bacteria. Uh, bacteria are vital in the, in the cycling of nutrients on our planet. If we didn't have bacteria along with the fungus helping decompose decaying matter, we'd be walking around in piles of dead stuff all the time. They also play a role in cycling of nutrients. Uh, we're going to spend a lot of time later in the year talking about how bacteria play a role in the nitrogen cycle. Um, there's plenty of nitrogen in the atmosphere, but in terms of usable nitrogen in the soil, uh, plants need bacteria to convert that nitrogen into that usable form. We also employ bacteria in industrial um, situations and in food applications. We use bacteria to process pollutants in a, in a process called bioremediation. 
um, the bacteria we use in our sewage treatment plants to clean the water and make it usable again. There are certain bacteria we've used to clean up oil spills because they tend to feed on the oils. And we've also used bacteria to flavor certain foods. So we've employed these bacteria for our purpose. And finally, we've used bacteria in genetic engineering. We use them to build copies of genes for us very quickly. That's it for part one of our video series on bacteria. Come back for part two. We look at bacterial reproduction and uh, genetic uh, exchange of genetic material. Uh, review this. Look over your notes. Prepare for a quiz in class.